sorry for the uh, short delay, you know. Um, I know you've been waiting a bit. So before we start, and welcome to uh, our Entrepreneurship and Capital 21st Century. Uh, we, I would like to introduce who we are first and what we do and why we do what we do. So we are Students for Liberty. Uh, we have our origins in, it's an international organization uh, with origins in the, in the US, started by students. And uh, so these are, this was from the first conference and founders are on the left. Uh, image. Uh, yeah, so we, what is the purpose of um, us doing what we do? So it, it, the idea of liberty uh, or what we, what, what we might basically call freedom is what we want to share at, uh, in Singapore and to change public opinion about freedom. So what exactly do we mean by freedom? Okay, so what we really believe in um, what we believe in can be summed up in these uh, these these three you know, categories: academic, social, and economic freedom. The freedom to contract with who you um, who you want to, to associate yourself with who you want to, to exchange value with each other, to share ideas freely, to to um, to think freely as well. And these are the, the, the these to have these things you uh, you need freedom. And in the end, we want also prosperity for um, uh, for society at large and prosperity can only come by freedom. That is what we believe and that's what we try to promote here. And so this is uh, uh, the basis of what we do. Uh, SFL is found all over the world. So in, uh, this is the, in the US, you've got, um, you've got charters in Africa, uh, in Europe, India, this is, I think this is Latin, this is Latin America. Uh, Hong Kong, this is Singapore. Uh, Japan, in the uh, Philippines, Indonesia. Yeah, so we are all over the world and we just started here uh, in July this year. And so we hold these sort of events uh, month to month. And so uh, our next event will be a film screening on uh, solving global poverty. So do come down. If you need, uh, want to know more about us, go to our Facebook page, which is at uh, uh, facebook.com slash Singapore SFL. And yeah, do, uh, we, we've got like a lot of interesting things <coughs> posted on our page, so you'll have a lot of fun reading it. And so before we go any further, I'll like introduce our speaker, Dr. Uh, Carmelo Felito. He's uh, the Senior Fellow Ideas which are in Kuala Lumpur, is the Institute of Democracy and Economic Affairs as well as uh, adjunct, uh, senior adjunct uh, faculty at uh, INTI, in, in, yeah, INTI uh, College in uh, Subang. So uh, he's, going to, he's, uh, he's also doing business, so a uh, very productive person here. Uh, he's, uh, yeah, he focuses on Austrian uh, business cycle theory, capital theory as well. So I think this will be a very fruitful time uh, if you want to learn um, more about uh, this complicated topic, uh, especially with pertinence to the 21st century. So uh, without further ado, yes, uh, Dr. Thank you. Good afternoon. 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 Can you hear me even without the mic? Yeah. It is fine? Okay. Uh, do you mind if I stay on this side so I can take a look at the slides? Otherwise, I will have the slides in the back, and I cannot follow. So we can, uh, here there are my contact details. Uh, and later, I also have uh, my business cards. If some of you, after the talk, would like to be uh, in touch with me and uh, further develop knowledge about the topics that we are going to touch uh, this afternoon. Uh, what are we going to do? This will be not a lecture about how to make money. So forget, forget about that. I know that when we talk about entrepreneurship, uh, most of the people think about you know this kind of uh, lectures which are very popular, in particular in Southeast Asia nowadays, with, uh, they become a, a billionaire before being 30, or invest like Warren Buffett, uh, th these kind of things. Okay, I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, this will be a much more theoretical uh, lecture, but uh, 
try to reconcile a theoretical approach uh, with reality, which is one of the main problem with uh, uh, mainstream economics, to do theories that in order to be proved uh, as true need to be deprived of any hook with reality. Okay? So we will try instead uh, to explain, to develop an approach about entrepreneurship, capital and business cycles with a theoretical approach with a solid uh, ground on reality. And in particular, my aim today will be to define theoretically entrepreneurship and capital as the outcome of subjective mental processes. So as something that, in a way, is related with your daily life. Secondly, uh, I will spend some time on business cycles and showing how business cycles are, in a way, a natural outcome of entrepreneurial action and capital formation. Finally, uh, I hope that I will make you convinced of how this kind of theoretical approach is uh, uh, grounded on reality. So, first of all, I need to clarify uh, a little bit the uh, framework about economics uh, that I develop and that I have in mind uh, in talking about entrepreneurship and capital. Economics is not about things and objects. How many of you has a sort of graduation in economics or the touch economics during college uh, studies? Business. Only few. Uh, good, good. So it means that you do not have already uh, prepacked ideas about economics. But in general, uh, if you go on uh, normal textbooks, mostly of the textbooks that are used in most of the colleges around the world, you will learn that economics is related with the uh, optimal usage of. Uh, uh, certain means in order to achieve certain ends. In my approach, which is actually the approach developed by the so-called Orsian School of Economics, they try to go a little deeper, um, claiming that uh, economics is about man, meanings, and actions. So it is true that in daily life we are engaged with the so-called economizing processes, uh, which means to choose how to allocate our scarce resources for definite ends. But there is something that come before, that come earlier, and this is the choice of the ends and means framework. Okay? So before deciding how to allocate certain resources in order to achieve certain ends, we have to define our ends and eventually choose our means. And uh, most of the uh, contemporary economic theory is developed without considering these preliminary uh, mental processes. And I give you a very simple example. Uh, when you wake up in the morning and you go, and you go uh, to do whatever you have to do uh, regarding your daily routine, you need to have a purpose in mind. You choose consciously, even if you are still quite asleep, uh, your daily purpose. You are going to work because you need money, you have to feed your family, but Nobody is forcing you to do so. First, you engage yourself with a choice. You chose your uh, purpose, your daily purpose. And therefore, economics should always stress about the importance of human actions as derived as the result of an acting mind. Before engaging in any action, we need to set in motion our mind. At the same time, 
human action needs to be understood and interpreted. This means that economics, in a way, is an hermeneutical science. Hermeneutics means uh, science of interpretation. Okay, so when I will talk about hermeneutical processes, I will have in mind uh, processes of interpretation. So I can, as an economist, uh, take note of the fact that you are all here. Okay. Uh, you came here to listen to me but I should do also a further step I should understand and interpret why are you here and here when I question myself in this way I open a wider spectrum of possibilities maybe you came here because you had in mind that uh, I was going to explain you how to become rich that's or, next door <laughs> yeah, next door. Yeah, there's a pattern in trading. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not rich, so uh, for sure I cannot teach anybody how to become rich. Right? <laughs> no, you're rich, yeah. You're rich in no, knowledge. No. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, who knows? We, we, we will, you will judge this at the end of the lecture. Uh, but for certain, uh, certainly, I, you, you might hear because maybe you had nothing better to do. Today, okay, it was a rainy day. You couldn't go running in the park. You couldn't go uh, walking around Jalan Jalan. So you decided simply to come here and listen to me. Uh, or maybe you came here because you were attracted by the picture. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there is a, such a wider spectrum of interpretation behind the objective fact that you are here. And as an economist, one of my tasks would be to try to understand why you are here, okay? I cannot stop myself at the simple uh, analysis of the fact that you are here, okay? There is something more. So, as uh, I just mentioned, human actions are indeed objective facts. But these objective facts are the answers to other objective facts constituting the, ele the elements of reality. But the way in which these answers are defined is totally subjective. The outcome of so-called interpretation processes, which uh, is what I defined hermeneutical actions. Okay? So, the fact that you wake up in the morning is objective. The fact that you enter the car every morning to go to work, to go to college, for doing whatever you have to do, is an objective fact. But this objective fact is a subjective answer to a certain stimulus coming from the reality. The proof of this is that in a classroom, uh, whenever a pretty lady enters the classroom, not all the uh, males in the class will react in the same way. Some will be heavily attracted, some will ignore, some will, be, uh, will dislike this lady, but in front of the same objective fact, a pretty lady that enters a classroom, we can have a very different subjective re reactions. And these subjective reactions not only change from individual to individual. They change also in the same individual in a different moment of time and space. Maybe if you are overly depressed for some reason, you will not know the beautiful lady entering the class. Okay? So the answer to objective facts is always uh, a subjective answer. And these hermeneutical processes in which we are engaged in front of every element of reality constitute the link between different objective facts. So the main weakness of modern day economics is that when they focus on economizing and maximizing functions, they don't keep into account this kind of subjective interpretational processes. So, maybe you are familiar with uh, the term homo economicus, 
which is always uh, in all the microeconomics textbooks, the homo economicus makes decisions with respect to a given series of ends and means. But the homo economicus perfectly react according to the theory. The homo economicus has perfect knowledge, the possibility of perfect forecast. Therefore, it's like a robot. In front of certain input, there is already a given output, which is the deterministic consequence of that input. But if you look at your daily life, you are not robots. You react in front of facts in original ways. Otherwise, in front of the same facts, we all would act in the same way. But this is not. This is because we are free, and in this is because we have not simply what the theory calls uh, imperfect knowledge, but because we have different knowledge. The kind of knowledge and information that we have in mind is completely different. Okay? We have different bytes, different bits of information, which, are, uh, which comes from our experiences, which is unique for every person. And therefore, the way in which we engage with reality is completely different. This fact is completely disregarded by mainstream economics. Therefore, what is important to introduce uh, before uh, talking about entrepreneurship is uh, a different category of man, the so-called homo agents. This is a Latin for saying the acting man. A real acting man is a man that, before making a choice, identify which ends to strive for and which means are available. And how are ends and means actually defined? Again, everything is defined by our expectations. Another element which is quite betrayed in the mainstream economics. Uh, there was an Italian rock band that was singing, without an idea, you don't get up from bed. Okay? And this is uh, the, the uh, central importance of expectations. Without an idea, you don't get out of bed in the morning. That means you get up because you want to achieve something. Okay? Therefore, without expectations, without expectation formation, we even cannot uh, imagine action. We can only imagine robots. Robots don't have expectations. They react in front of inputs. So individual action takes place in a context which generates via hermeneutical processes expectations about the future. And it is precisely according to such expectations that human minds define their set of ends and corresponding means thought to be adequate to achieve ends. If you go to college to find a partner is different than going to college uh, to get graduated. I mean, the things can go together, but uh, uh, there are two different, uh, two different kind of expectations. So, of course, if you go to college in order to find a partner, you will spend more time in the clubs, in the bars, in all the so-called social life around the college. Otherwise, you would spend more time in the classroom. This guy. So, to summarize, Human action consists of actual implementation of plans, the utilization of means to reach goals, defined by expectations, generated by interpretative processes, in turn, sprouting from the impact between human beings and surrounding reality. So, you impact with reality, okay, every day. Your impact with reality will generate expectations, According to these expectations, you will fix your ends and you will define plans in order to achieve your ends. And this is the very nature of human action, which is at the base, which should be at the very base, at the very core of economics. Is it clear so far? 
One important thing is that these ends, means, and plans, and expectations are not uh, fixed once and forever. Uh, I will not go too deep into this distinction, but the important thing that you have to bring home is that our, all our actions, all our plans, implementations, happen through a very important dimension. And this dimension is time. Can you imagine an action that doesn't imply the consumption of time? Time is the most important resource. And this is, is it is the scarce resource par excellence. Why time is important? Because time is the main uh, river of novelty, of information, of new knowledge. If you go to college in the morning and uh, suddenly you fall in love with a certain lady, you decide to set in motion uh, a plan. Let's say to bring, to try to invite uh, this lady for dinner, okay? But in the moment in which you go to her and you invite her for dinner, time will bring in some news. In example, this girl might dislike you or might have another boyfriend, which is not always an obstacle, but uh, in some <laughs> cases can be. Uh, but her reaction, anyway, will bring into your content of information an element of novelty. And you will have to engage with this novelty. So if the lady says you, no, I don't come out with you, of course, you must revise your plan. You must think, maybe I have to look for another one, or I have to try to insist to invent something else. But the important thing is that new information came into your mind, and this new information will force you to revise your plan. And this is really the nature of human action. There is no human action that from the starting point until completion uh, doesn't uh, imply any process of revision. Same for business decisions, as we will see. So, now, saying this, we can enter uh, the topic of today. We can start to deal with entrepreneurship. You will think that maybe I'm a little crazy, but uh, I hope I will convince you of the contrary, and that all this uh, big introduction that we have developed is uh, strictly related with uh, entrepreneurship. So what we have seen is uh, the concept of human action developed by an Austrian economist called Ludwig von Mises, which can be divided into these points that I summarize here, the choice of means and ends, the setting up of plan and their implementation, the information transmissions that is brought in uh, during the process of implementation of plans, the central role of expectations, and the fact that we all have different and imperfect knowledge. So, you are all convinced that what I described so far is a process of human, a process of actions with which all of you is engaged every day? Do you feel familiar the descriptions that I've given you? Is something that sounds as uh, uh, actually happening in your life? Yes, no? Yes, yes good. So we are not talking about clouds, or well, as we say in Italy, we are not talking about angel sex, right? Okay, so we can move ahead. Now, what happened about uh, your plans uh, with which you are engaged every day? In a way, this is an element of entrepreneurship which regards your daily life. So in the moment in which you are setting up your ends and defining your plans 
consist consistently with your expectations and while you develop your plan you might revise your choice in a way you are an entrepreneur okay when we move uh, into business we are simply uh, going into a specific category of uh, uh, plans and actions but if we go at the core at the nature of these kind of actions this is not different so when you try to go to college to pursue your degree you are engaged in an entrepreneurial process you might have done something different but at a certain moment for all the reasons that you have in mind you decided to go to college. When you decide to approach a certain person to become your partner, you are involved in an entrepreneurial action. Right? Think about it. You decide to bring out a lady in the evening. For sure you are making a choice about time. I stay home watching a movie, I stay home studying, I go out with my friends drinking a beer, or I invite a lady. These are all choices that you can do with your time, not only with your time, but also with your money. And if you decide to go out with a lady, you might think to go to cinema, or to go to dinner, or to do both. This depends on your budget constraint and your expectations. Okay? But you are expecting, in a way, to get a profit out of it, if we define profit in a very... Uh, wide way. When we do something, we are always entrepreneurs in the sense that we are trying to make a profit, which defining it in a, in a better way is we are all trying to get better off. Right? There is a someone that in the moment in which set in motion an action is trying to get worse off eh? you're trying you are here because you think to be more unhappy at the end or because you think to get something out of this you think that in a way whatever it is you have in mind an idea of profit right in coming here it can be getting knowledge uh, getting smarter uh, knowing new people, etc., etc. But you all have in mind an idea of profit. In this sense, entrepreneurship is a very basic element inscribed in each human action. So this is the first concept that I really want you to bring home today. We are all entrepreneurs of our life. In a way, every single action, every plan that we set in motion is an entrepreneurial action. Then we can move more into the business discussion, and we can, of course, note that some plans are smarter or quicker than others in identifying unexploited profit opportunities this is uh, not something different this is the concept of entrepreneurship uh, developed by another economist called Israel Kirzner but uh, this is not something different with what we have seen so far is uh, simply moving this kind of analysis from the personal level from the very personal life from the daily routine into business action okay but the nature of this is not different so if we move into uh, the analysis of people that are engaged with business activities some of them are more able than other to see where a good can be sold at the high at the price higher than that for which can be bought and uh, this situation, this is probably uh, the most important element of a certain kind of entrepreneurship, of basic entrepreneurship, 
when applied to business life is this alertness to unexploited profit opportunities okay so let's uh, talk in a simple way if you walk to Orchard Street okay to come here maybe uh, many of you did it you can notice certain uh, shops there is more or less everything there right you can find everything there uh, but some of you can be smarter than others and realize that in example there is not uh, a, a shop of biological yogurt I don't know I just guess uh, and so some of you could decide to invest his resources into opening uh, a shop of biological yogurt okay? and try to make money out of it of course once this decision is made uh, you are open to a very wide uh, spectrum of possibilities you might find that nobody likes uh, biological yogurt and therefore you will close down your shop your shop in a very short while you can find out that uh, you are successful or some of the ingredients that you choose are wrong this is the wide spectrum of business activities but one of the probably the main feature of uh, uh, basic entrepreneurship applied to business life is the ability the what Kirchner called alertness to unexploited profit opportunities that simply means being alert to something where nobody else is alert and this can happen only because the content of information of all the uh, participants to the market process are, uh, is imperfect if everybody had the same content of knowledge if we already knew everything that needs to be known as the mainstream economics actually assumes there would be no space for entrepreneurship right? there would be no space for competition in a world of perfect knowledge where we all know everything and we know the perfect answer to every situation there is no room for entrepreneurship because there is nothing to be discovered instead entrepreneurship so defined lies precisely in the fact that not everybody knows everything so uh, just to give another stupid example I'm Italian and I'm supposed uh, to know how to make tomato sauce better than uh, Singaporeans uh, and or, to sing. Eh? or to sing or to sing we are both Italian so that's what we are why you are not singing like sing, perfect yeah. singing a uh, perfect love song uh, <laughs> and therefore I might engage with my friend here on Orchard Street and sing love songs and make money out of it okay this could eventually happen because we know something that other people don't know and we might try to create expectations out of that right mm -hmm. yeah. sorry my question is that if you're assuming that people will make the same decision giving the same information that like you mentioned no. in the earlier no no example, no right? no 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 i'm it's, it's totally no it's not like this because like you're saying that if people are given perfect information then they will make like there's no room for competition yeah. but if everyone has perfect information okay. people can still make different decisions based on those information but if you look at reality, perfect knowledge doesn't exist. It's a fiction. Yeah. There, there is a someone that can say, I know everything about this. Not I mean, if we go back to probably the greatest master of mankind, Socrates. Socrates was uh, uh, told by Apollo, by an oracle, that he was the wisest man and Socrates uh, started to go round round inquiring other philosophers or politicians other smart people to find out if it was true that he was the wisest man on earth as Apollo said but uh, what Socrates found out was that he was the smartest man only for one reason 
because he was the only the only man conscious of the fact that he didn't know anything. <laughs> While the other had a so-called pretense of knowledge about many things, he was the only one aware not to know something. And according to this, Apollo defined him, defined him as the wisest man on earth. So, uh, let's say the father of the Western thought, Socrates, uh, became famous rightly because he was aware about imperfect knowledge. And so we have, we have connected in, uh, in two minutes Socrates with Austrian economics. Probably nobody did it, this, and maybe Lee can uh, advise us on this, but <laughs> I think that we achieved an important new theoretical point. Socrates as the father of Austrian economics. Comment. <laughs> Forgive me to intervene with due regard and respect. But when we are talking about the entrepreneurship version one, this is what it is, but we have not reached the point of version 2, edition 3, and so on. So the question is that there's a lot of shortcoming in, the, in between the gap. Like, for example, when you say alertness and awareness are different things, interpretation and translation two different things. And when you say about smarter, quicker, identify unexploited profit you know, opportunities, this is not really about profit orientation. It could be on something beyond profit. Non-profit is non-profit. It's not because of profit. But uh, if you listen to what I just said a yeah. few minutes ago, defining profit in a wider acception, which means the idea to get better off. Mm -hmm. No, the question is definition of profit, reward, incentive, material form. It may not be there. So the I never, I never define it in the material yeah, yeah. way. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. You, you have to define it because in, in what sense that you say that you know question of profit? I, I just said profit. people perceiving the idea of being better off. Mm -hmm. Better off means many things. Yes, yes. But means see, many things. The black and but, white. but, yeah. but if you are going into business, okay, we are talking about uh, a strict definition of entrepreneurship as applied to the world of uh, physical enterprises, okay, of course the final outcome can be only the fact that uh, uh, your proceedings are higher than your costs. And this is the definition of profit. If you don't achieve that, you must change your direction because there is no way to survive. But in material definition, but you didn't say something that beyond material definition, that reward can be, you know, you feel... I said better off. Better yeah. off means, uh, means everything. No, I mean, Not really? Yes. Not if really because if I want... go to church, I go to church every Sunday, it's because at the end I feel better off. Better off in a non-material way, but better that off is, is open. That is spiritual. But, but yeah. still is better off. Yeah. No, so no. better off, yes. But, better it's off. Still, but it's still a profit. No, no, no. no it's it's not only you, you, know, you are, you are giving, you are giving a restriction to the world. No, no, so no. your definition is much stricter than the one that no, I'm no, giving no, now. No, no, because you know why when you say a wider definition, then you have inverted commas, say wider definition. Because you know why? If you don't, it is restricted to what material means. Because likewise, for example, when you have, you know, the definition of even entrepreneurship, which is on those elements that you mentioned, are two version one. And which is actually is what it is ongoing. So the question is though, what you don't know, what you don't know. So the question you must have reservation that this is what I know and this is what I don't know. Practicing, practicing dimension is different. Uh, you know, theory is different. Information for research purposes is different. So it is not one only one size. It doesn't. I, That's said, what I'm trying I to say. say that there is at the basic at the basic of human action, and I said this at the beginning. Uh, and every decision is, uh, in a way, entrepreneurial for our daily life. I say we are all entrepreneurs of our daily life. Then uh, the concept is to act with the idea to be better off. And better off has a very wide definition. Better off cannot be defined only in a material way. If I, uh, I mention the example of going out with a lady, I mention the example of getting graduated in a college, these are all things in which the final reward that we try to achieve is not strictly material. Okay, I mentioned the example of going to church, 
which is the idea to get better off spiritually speaking. But when we move to the side of uh, a company, business, if the business is not achieving a material profit, the business is closing down. Then you can decide personally, because I have resources in excess to waste and I don't mind to, in a way, burn my resources into doing something even if there is no profit out of that, no material profit out of that, but this is for my personal gratification, then uh, still this doesn't change the fact that you have resources that come from something else to go into that. But in a normal enterprise that uh, support, that uh, incur in certain costs, if at the end of the production process and with the encounter with the market, you, your revenues are not higher than your costs, then, sorry to say, your life is not long. Uh, this is one principle of uh, uh, basic accountability. So I graduated as a bookkeeper. So <laughs> I know that, uh, and I work as a general manager in a multinational company. So if uh, I can be generous, but if my company doesn't make material profit, I don't pay the salaries of my employees. And I can find all the enjoyment that I want in running the company, but if there is no material profit, there is no company to run. This is, uh, this is the reality. Eh? It's, uh, it's not to be uh, dramatic or negative. This is the reality, the reality of things. I was not born rich, so I know very well that uh, if uh, we have uh, no material resources, there is uh, nothing to achieve for, nothing to strive for. I mean, there are no resources in order to achieve our purposes. I wanted to graduate. My parents didn't have money for uh, paying for my studies. I, I worked because I needed money, actually. This is very simple. Because you see, the question of smarter and appropriate can be different. Smarter can be, you know, redefined, recorrected, redefined. Yeah, but we, I, cannot, I cannot spend my lecture in yeah, defining no, every, no, single, no, but you see the question every single word. You say, for example, you want to have the first heading. You say that this is confined to business entrepreneurship. Like, yes. I, I told it. Yeah. I told it. No, so no. If we move entrepreneurship into the business side, then we have to go this. This is what I told just before this slide. <coughs> we can move on. Move with the slide as well. Maybe you, you can think about uh, value instead of profit. Maybe from that perspective, maybe help will help you comprehend a little bit. Forgive me. Thank you for the intervention. Because the West goes on value at the expense of virtue. They have no no element of virtue. They go for value. You won't be able to convert. But the, 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 value the, the, task, the, the task of uh, economists is not uh, to define virtues uh, and uh, as an economist, I don't enter the moral judgment of an initiative. I can say, in example, that uh, uh, at a certain point, Pablo Escobar was a successful entrepreneur. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not saying that no. he was, uh, you must understand he, he that you, you he was an angel. You as an economist in a Western context, an economist of Western orientation, which is, you define by that. But, you know, other than Western, you know, uh, interpretation, you did not evaluate the possibility that the non Western have got different ways of doing it. How about the kid that you okay. hate you to later? Yeah. So we move ahead. Uh, stay, stay, stay stuck here. Now I want to mix the wide definition that Kirzner gave about entrepreneurship as. Uh, uh, alertness to unexploited profit opportunities with uh, the entrepreneurship as defined by another economist which is very dear to me uh, but that goes by the name of Joseph Schumpeter Joseph Schumpeter, I don't know if you ever encountered this economist but uh, probably you read on uh, newspapers and magazines the expression creative destruction you encounter this? Okay, this expression comes from this man who in turn <coughs> stole this expression from Werner Zombart, which was a previous economist, but the fact is that Werner Zombart 
never published into English, so uh, he didn't become famous for this expression. Mm -hmm. Schumpeter, at a certain point, went to uh, teach at Harvard, decided to <laughs> use this expression, translate it to English, and everybody in the academic world knows this as a Schumpeterian idea, when it is indeed a Zombatarian uh, idea. But to make it short, Schumpeter gives uh, a stricter definition of en entrepreneurship. Okay? And uh, uh, in a while I will explain how I don't see this in necessarily in conflict with what we have seen so far. Uh, Schumpeter defined entrepreneurship as the attitude toward innovation. Okay? And uh, this uh, can manifest itself uh, in five ways. First of all, the introduction of new goods. Second, the introduction of a new method of production. Third, the opening of a new market. Fourth, the conquest of a new source of supply of raw materials. And fifth, the carrying out of uh, a new organization of any industry. According to Schumpeter, these elements can be called new combinations and they are the essence of economic development. For Schumpeter, without this, without the appearance of one of these elements, the economy simply replicates itself, okay, without novelty. So these are revolutionary elements. And the entrepreneur is precisely the leader who introduces uh, new combinations. So for Schumpeter, entrepreneurship is not something, as I just mentioned, present at a certain extent in every human being, okay? But it's something that can be attributed only to special uh, people with uh, an attitude toward leadership and intuition. For Schumpeter, in example, uh, entrepreneurs has the dream and the will to found a private kingdom. They have the will to conquer and the joy of creating. So you can see that uh, this definition is much narrower than what we have seen so far. But I believe that in a way uh, this vision can be combined with what we have seen so far. And this is uh, one of my greatest innovation uh, and my greatest contributions to economic theory. Uh, the uh, mixing together of the concept of human action, Kirchnererian alertness, and uh, Schumpeterian innovation. I will explain what I have in mind. We have uh, uh, a broad category of uh, human action, this purposeful human action. You get out of bed in the morning because you want to achieve something. Okay and you are all engaged in trying to achieve your ends. As a subset of these, we have special actions that uh, as, as a main feature, the fact to be alert to profit opportunities into the business uh, sector. And as a smaller subset, among all these initiative, economic initiatives that are defined as uh, uh, alertness to profit opportunities, we have special entrepreneurial initiatives which brings revolutionary elements into the economic system and therefore can be defined as innovation because they bring an element of discontinuity with the way to do things. Think about uh, internet and emails, okay, just to have something very close to our daily experience. Now, when you go to office, the first thing that you do is to turn on your computer, probably, right? And to check your emails, and to use email to send offer to your customers, to interact with your colleagues, with your suppliers, and etc., etc. But think about uh, 20 years ago. 20 years ago is not uh, a a very revolutionary time is less than a generation. But 20 years ago, we didn't have emails in the office. Well, I was not working, I was still studying, but <laughs> I'm not that old. Uh, but maybe someone in the room older than me 
remember a time in which you had to send the offers to your clients by a post, with a courier, yeah? Yeah. Uh, before even the invention of the fax. Yes. Okay? So imagine how much more <laughs> relaxed was the life when you didn't have your clients WhatsApping you at 9 p.m. <laughs> asking to revise an offer before tomorrow morning. You have to wait for the post, to deliver, uh, and, and then the answer, and then the answer come back uh, by post again. So maybe you have a couple of weeks of break in which uh, your daily life can be a little bit more relaxed. In fact, the technology is not improving our life. No, it's making us as much <laughs> worse in a way. It's not. <laughs> it's true. But this is a paradoxical example to show uh, how certain innovations which are, as such, if they are applied to the production process, like uh, IT, like uh, internet, like emails, change radically our life. So this kind of things can introduce, can be, uh, can fall into the category of Schumpeterian entrepreneurship. The idea to open another uh, a kind of restaurant in Orchard Road can be into the category of Kirzenerian alertness. For sure, or, uh, can bring, br bring you profit, but will not uh, uh, bring a revolution to the economic system. Okay? So this is clear, the difference. So to open a new restaurant in Orchard Street might be a source of profit, but it is not a source of revolution into the way of doing things of the economic system, like internet was. The idea to go to college to conquer a girl is <laughs> among the uh, broader category of human action. So you still try to achieve a profit in a way, you are trying to be better off, but uh, under the general purposes of human action. So we, what we define profit in a broad way, not necessarily related with business. So it's clear how the approach to entrepreneurship that I developed unfolded itself into these three steps. And then now is a part of your decisions to remain in the blue, to try to go into this uh, orange, or to be into the white section. Which doesn't mean necessarily to become very rich. Eh? To be an innovator, a uh, certain generation doesn't mean necessarily to become very rich. Uh, we look at uh, Warren Buffett, we, you all have the uh, myth of Warren Buffett. I worked for him for three years, uh, yeah, selling feeders for chicken. Because Warren Buffett has also companies selling things for the chicken. So I worked for him, but in the poultry industry. Um, so Warren Buffett is bloody rich, but he never engaged into a process of Schumpeterian entrepreneurship. Yeah. But of course, is into the level of Kirzenerian entrepreneurship. He's alert to profit opportunities. It's very clear, this. But uh, the kind of investment that he made uh, didn't bring big change into the, the way of doing things, into the economic life, like internet brought in, like mobile phones brought in. Later on, he eventually invests in that. But he's not an innovator, OK? Let's move on. How much time I still have? Because I have a lot of to say. I would do like six hours. Six? Can I go up to six? OK. You are bored? No. Not yet? OK, good. Uh, of course, when uh, we think about human action, alerts, alertness, and innovation, uh, we all have a vogue, a vague idea that all this has to deal with capital, the capital goods. So in order to achieve your ends, which are defined by expectations, you need to implement plans. And usually when we think about the implementation of plans, we all think that in a way we need the capital. This is one of the most abused uh, words probably in the uh, economic jargon, but for sure, is a word we, uh, which we all have in mind, but probably we uh, attribute to it different meanings. And if I ask you what you have in mind by capital, what do you think? 
human capital, which means ideas, uh, creativity. You? More of uh, material capital. Money. Money. Of course, a lot. If you want to go out even with a girl, you need money to pay for the pizza. <laughs> you, what do you think about capital? I think money. Money. So we are in Singapore, everybody is thinking about money. <laughs> But <clears throat> the most and initial things to be realized is that when we talk about capital and what you said indeed uh, is a proof, uh, we have in mind heterogeneous goods. Some of you talk about ideas, human capital, something that we cannot really touch. We cannot really have uh, a, con a concrete a quanti quantitative idea of what human capital is. But then someone else mentioned money. Money is more easy to count. You just pile it one <laughs> after the other. It's easy. But let's uh, first make a step uh, earlier and try to define a good. Please. OK, this is very important. A thing needs to be in a conscious, conscious causal connection with the need satisfaction in order to be a good. And here again, the central role of expectations. Uh, why it is important than consciousness? If I go to the restaurant and I want to cut a steak and my final aim is to eat a steak, it's clear nowadays that I need a fork and a knife. So fork and a knife, in a way, are the capital goods that will help me to achieve my end, which is to eat the stack. But they become as such if I recognize this quality. If I'm not aware that uh, fork and uh, knife can be used to cut the stack, for me are just objects on the table. <laughs> they are not capital goods. So you understand this is the the passage that I want you to do as the main one uh, on the capital part is that even on the definition of capital we need subjective processes of interpretation if you are not conscious that a certain object, a certain good can bring you somewhere can help you to achieve a certain end that good is useless so it's not capital is it clear? Mm -hmm. You get the point? So, if you take someone coming from the jungle and never saw a fork in front of the stack, we will not, we will not know what to do. So, it remains there. So, here we still have to stress the hermeneutical nature of these processes. The possibility for a thing to satisfy a need is not primarily an objective one. Initially, the thing is thought to be suitable for a need satisfaction. And then we have, of course, to engage with the reality test. Okay? I might think that a fork is good to eat a spoon, and so in my mind, to, to eat a soup, sorry. So in my mind, the fork become a capital good when thinking about the soup but in the moment in which I engage with the fork and there is no soup remaining <laughs> I have to revise my idea so initially that the good was thought as suitable to achieve my end but at the test with reality it doesn't work so I have to revise my idea and this is the, the point that I need to stress because uh, uh, when we talk about subjectivity, we cannot think about the subjectivity uh, or hermeneutical processes that are not engaged with reality. Reality is always the final, the final test. Okay, so we can think that uh, this is a car, but when you try to turn turn it on, it doesn't <laughs> work. So it is not, and this is how we are distinguished by certain to certain nihilist. Uh, philosophers, no, C certain philosophers think that uh, uh, reality doesn't exist and it's simply defined by our mind. 
our mind has to engage with an interpretation of reality but reality is what it is okay so I might think that this is a car but in the end when I test it it is not and I must recognize it uh, okay so in order for a thing to become a good it is necessarily primarily that this good is thought as suitable for a need satisfaction and afterward such suitability need to be tested in reality and this testing process is never at rest a thing could lose or acquire good status if circumstances change so if uh, I want uh, uh, eat the stack, uh, the spoon is not a capital good but if they bring me soup my reality change and therefore the spoon change from being something useless to being something useful because now my uh, final aim change move from stack to soup and therefore what was not useful before the spoon becomes useful okay so the reality test is uh, never at rest has to be continuously uh, brought in as the reality change and then now that we have defined goods how we distinguish goods from capital goods first of all we have to say that goods are capital goods as I just mentioned by virtue of an economic function subjectively identified and not by the physical features they might have physical features again that serve my final end but if I don't recognize it then they don't acquire the status, the status of capital goods and this is my uh, specific uh, uh, definition of capital goods that can be found actually in the book that is there later you can decide to purchase a copy, all the ideas that I'm going to, uh, to talk today are uh, expressed in this uh, small book called Hermeneutics of Capital Capital goods are the goods that in a specific moment in time which means a certain specific set of conditions are thought to be suitable to generate a certain output when combined with other goods in a production process unfolding in time and it will be the unfolding of the production process which will confirm their suitability as capital goods clear? Mm -hmm. or obscure? Who said obscure? give the definition of what you mean by capital this one <laughs> is exactly this so goods yeah. that in a moment I want to achieve certain ends let's say I have a company, a factory and I want to produce a certain product so when I sit down and I make my plan in a certain moment in a certain specific moment in time I identify, I think that certain good could generate the output that I desire when combined together of course, good capital goods are always in combination in a production process that unfold in time so I'm an entrepreneur sit down, I want to produce laptops and then I think, what do I need? and then I list certain uh, goods that I think that if I combine them, them together into a production process in time there are no production processes without time we generate the output uh, that I want but of course, at least a theoretical level, is only in the unfolding of the production process that this idea will be confirmed. Okay? At least a theoretical level, I might be wrong about what I can obtain with the combination of certain things. Or I might be wrong about the time that is required. Yeah, you see, you use the term virtue of an economic function. That's exactly. You said just now earlier you do not wish to, uh, trans uh, uh, you know, <coughs> you just not wish to uh, subscribe to the elements, the faith, the basic of uh, of virtue in your 
in your principle, but you see that you can't run away from it. This is just a word by virtue of an economic thought <laughs> no, 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 that no, no. can be can yes, be defined yes. as because of an economic function. Exactly. If I take out by virtue and you I make it, and I put because is the same, is a grammar. This is grammar. You're not making, a, you're making a grammar mistake. You know? no, no, no. This, no, this is no, not this is not virtue like goodness. Yeah. No, like, no, no, no. It no. means simply the because. The terminology when I'm referring to the terminology is not a grammar. By virtue, yeah, in this case, that. by but virtue, this case, if I don't point it out, she will not yeah. say that. It's by true. virtue means because of. I think it's, it's a grammar issue. It's better to check the English dictionary. The by virtue is because of. You see, it's you're, not telling, you're telling, telling me we have different version of the understanding because the virtue when you use a terminology, <laughs> it's not a grammar. By vir by virtue means because of you check the dictionary. Exactly. Yeah. So, can we move on? It's not virtues and values here. Yeah. It's a virtue because of. Uh, in my uh, theory, and this is uh, why, as I mentioned before, some of the ideas that uh, I mentioned are brought in because I took it from some economists and I always mention them. Uh, this is instead a distinction that comes uh, from my own, and uh, is the distinction between potential capital goods and actual capital goods. Uh, this might seem maybe useful only at a theoretical level, but is important uh, because it distinguishes two specific moments into the life of an entrepreneur. Potential capital goods are the goods that I think in a certain moment, okay, as to be suitable for generating an output when combined together in a production process. The actual capital goods are the goods that I actually implement together into a production process, okay, because in exception.